And Ari, I just wanted to add two quick things to your introduction. It was a great introduction. Um, my book about Superman was not just about Superman, it was about the Jewish Superman. And, the, and I had a blast going and talking at Jewish uh, book festivals all across America about why Superman was Jewish and what that meant to me and to the Jewish audiences I was talking to. And one of my earlier books was on the Jewish diaspora. And I just wanna say that the, I've done in the month that this book is out, probably 25 to 30 virtual talks. But the last two nights I had an extraordinary experience, which was doing live talks and something that I thought weren't gonna happen for a very long time. And they were, one was at a baseball stadium. Any of you who have ever been to Cape Cod during the summer know that there's this great thing called the Cape Cod Baseball League. And I see the crafts holding up their hands, the um, Cape Cod Baseball League. And the talk two nights ago was in a baseball stadium, the Katuit Kettleers Baseball Stadium, where there was masking tape in the bleachers for where people could safely sit six feet uh, spaced apart from one another. And it was magical. And the only thing more magical was doing a talk last night on the Kennedys just outside of Hyannis, Massachusetts, where there were painted circles in the grass where people could put their beach chairs safely to be six feet apart from one another. And it was, again, there were lots of Kennedys there and it was a magical audience, but I love being with you here today. And I wanna start out by telling you a bit about, one, one of the things that Ari was too polite to say was that there have been a hundred biographies already on Joe McCarthy. And he was too polite to ask the obvious question, why did the world need the 101st biography? And I wanna tell you briefly a little bit about things that I saw in the course of doing this book that people hadn't seen before. But before I do that, I would love people to just physically raise their hand if they lived through the era of Joe McCarthy. How many people out there? So just about everybody remembers it in person. And the first thing that I saw that nobody had ever seen before, when Joe McCarthy, after Joe McCarthy died, his widow, Jean McCarthy, left all of his personal and professional papers to his alma mater, which is Marquette University in Milwaukee. And for 60 years, biographers have been writing about him and begging the family to let them see the bi all of these papers. They contained everything from his love letters to his wife, to his real time World War II handwritten diaries, to all of these documents that had a big stamp on them saying top secret that the FBI and the CIA and other government agencies were leaking to Senator McCarthy. And people asked and the family either said no or just ignored them. And so I came along and I asked and the family didn't bother saying no, they just ignored me. And they ignored me for a full two years. And exactly one week after I told my publisher and my wife that we were never gonna see those papers, I got an email from the chief archivist at Marquette saying, you're gonna get to see those papers. This woman, I'm convinced, was convinced herself that she would die with only her and nobody else ever getting to see what was in those files. And for some reason, and Charlie can tell you, Charlie and I know one another a bit, and he could tell you that it is not because I am charming, but for some reason, and I think it's because I was enough of a pain in the neck that I didn't go away, they decided the way to make me go away was to let me have a look. And they let me have a look in a very unusual way. They said, you can look at these papers and the day you stop looking, they go back under lock and key. So it was sort of every journalist and every author's dream. And I will tell you in a little bit, some of the things that I found in those papers, which changed my view, and I think ought to change our view about who Joe McCarthy was. A second set of papers had actually already been made public when I started reading, uh, when I started researching my book. And those were, can I ask again for a show of hands for anybody who watched in real time the Army McCarthy hearings on television or followed them in newspapers? 
So a lot of you may remember those hearings. And I thought those hearings were the first and last word of what Joe McCarthy did when he held congressional hearings. It turns out that his public hearings were only a third of the hearings he held. The other two thirds were behind closed doors. He kicked out the public and he said to the press, you've got to leave too. And so we have never known what was going on behind those closed doors. And not long before I started researching my book, the government decided to make those hearings public. And my old friend, who was the official historian of the Senate, was in charge of doing that, curating, they called it, the hearing records. And reporters looked briefly at them, but there were 9,000 pages of transcripts. And those show Joe McCarthy unhinged. When he thought nobody was watching, he was even more outrageous than when he knew the cameras were there. And those are a second set of documents that nobody had ever done a deep dive into. The third set was something that I was convinced I was never gonna get to see because they are the most cherished of records that any of us have, which were Joe McCarthy's medical records. The files from Bethesda Naval Hospital that show us what Joe McCarthy died of and he didn't die of what the coroner told us he died of. They showed us the addictions he had and those addictions explain a whole lot about the way he behaved. And those were something that again, I told my wife and my publisher that I was never gonna see. And exactly a week later, my wife and I were out for a very early morning walk with our dog and there was an enormous brown box at the head of our driveway. And that box had every medical file from Bethesda Naval Hospital that opened up this new picture of who Joe McCarthy was. And the point in telling you about these is that if with the access to all of these files, I couldn't write a good book, then shame on me. So I wanna tell you a little bit about what I found out about Joe McCarthy that wasn't what I thought about him before I started writing my book. And I wanna do that by asking if you would come with me from in front of your computer screen to three critical moments in Joe McCarthy's life that I think tell us a whole lot about who he was. And the first was in a place called Wheeling, West Virginia or as Joe McCarthy's staff referred to it, Wheeling West by God, Virginia, in the middle of nowhere. And on February 9th, 1950, Joe McCarthy was invited to give a big speech in Wheeling, West Virginia. And it was on a day that is a sacred day to Republicans all across America. It was on the birthday of the patron saint of the Republican party, Abraham Lincoln. And if you're a prominent Republican in America, you're the president or you're a senator who matters, you get invited to deliver the Lincoln dinner speech in a place that matters. It might be Los Angeles, it might be New York, it might be Chicago or Boston or Washington. If you're Joe McCarthy in 1950, a backbench senator who looked like he was a shoe in to be a one-term senator, and nobody had ever really heard of this guy, you get invited to a place like Wheeling, West Virginia, where no offense to Wheeling, where it, it doesn't exactly fit on the center of the national map. And Joe McCarthy shows up that night in Wheeling, West Virginia with a large briefcase. And in that briefcase are two speeches. And he's not sure until the last minute which one of the speeches he's gonna pull out of his briefcase. One of them was a snoozer of a speech on national housing policy. And that happened to be something that Joe McCarthy actually knew a bit about. And had he delivered that speech that night, 70 years later, we wouldn't be here talking about Joe McCarthy because he would have gone on to serve exactly one term and we would have quickly forgotten him. Instead, he reaches in his briefcase and he pulls out the second speech. And that is a barn burner of a speech on communist spies in the US government. Now, I don't know what you remember 
1950, of February 1950. But I want to remind you for a minute what was going on in America at that moment. The Soviet Union was a major scary force in our lives. Not long before February of 1950, the nationalist China, the China of Chiang Kai-shek, had been transformed to Red China, the China of Mao Zedong. The Rosenbergs, the atomic spies, had recently been exposed, they had been tried, and they had been convicted and sentenced to death. Not long after this speech, and it is only an audience of your vintage that will believe what I'm about to say, not long after that speech, we actually taught every school child in America that in the event of an atomic attack, they should do what was called duck and cover. Does anybody remember what duck and cover was? It meant you put your hands over your head and you ducked under your desk. And if there was an atomic bomb, that would protect you. You'd be fine as long as you were under your desk with your hands over your head. And that was how afraid we were in America at that moment. And the speech that Joe McCarthy pulled out of his briefcase that night was a speech that played brilliantly to those fears. He held up in his hand a set of documents and he said, I have in my hand a list of 205 spies at the US State Department. Those are people that President Roosevelt should have known about. Those are people he should have rooted out of our government. And those are people who are making us unsafe. Now, even though I saw in his personal and professional files, lots of versions of that speech, we're not sure exactly which one he had in his hand that night, but we can say definitively 70 years later, one thing, whatever he had in his hand that night, it sure as heck wasn't a list of 205 spies in the State Department. If there were 205 spies, which I don't believe, Joe McCarthy had no clue who they were. And what he did was took a bunch of recycled names, names exposed by the earlier House Un-American Activities Committee, names that he might have grabbed from the teletype machine, names that I'm convinced his numbers varied on the number of spies that he had in his hand, and they went from 205 to 207 to a famous number 57. And I'm convinced that that number 57 may have come from a uh, stopover that McCarthy made at a Hamburg joint on his way to give his speech that night in Wheeling. And I think he actually might have poured some Heinz 57 sauce on his burger that night and that that number might have stuck in his mind because that was the lack of logic in anything that Joe McCarthy was saying. But it didn't matter. What mattered was within two days, Joe McCarthy was on the front page of every newspaper in America. And that night, February 9th, 1950, the McCarthy crusade was born and the movement that we would call McCarthyism was born. And his opportunism in picking whatever issue happened to dawn on him before he showed up that night was extraordinary. And I'm convinced that he had never read the speech that he delivered that night before he got to Wheeling, West Virginia. It was composed by a journalist that he paid. It was edited by his staff, but it didn't matter. Joe McCarthy was looking for an issue that would give him the spotlight. He found it in Wheeling, West Virginia. It was anti-communism. And as I say, he never looked back. So I want to take you with me for a minute. Moment number one of my three moments was that night when McCarthyism was born in Wheeling, West Virginia. And I actually want to look at, we're going to take a quick look, if I can figure out how to do it, for anybody who doesn't remember what Joe McCarthy looked like at that point. Um, can you see on your screen a picture? This is the early Joe McCarthy. This is the guy who came back from World War II calling himself Tail Gunner Joe. And this is a picture that was out on every piece of campaign literature that that early Joe McCarthy used. It was a picture showing him as a World War II 
hero. And we'll talk about that again later, but that's what the early Joe McCarthy looked like. Moment number two is at the beginning of 1954 and at the beginning of the most famous hearings ever held in Congress. And they were called the Army McCarthy hearings. And in late fall 1953, Joe McCarthy was eager to find another target. He had already aimed his guns at the State Department. He had gone after the Voice of America and he had gone after the White House and President Truman. And now he decided that he was gonna take on an even bigger target. And that was the US Army. And he said that a particular Army base called Fort Monmouth in New Jersey, a base that had the command and control center for every branch of the US military, a very sensitive base. Joe McCarthy told us that that base was infested with nests of communist moles. He went after, after a target that was even bigger than the White House and the State Department. I think the military was and is the most democratic institution in America. And especially in that World War II, in that post-World War II era, Everybody had lost somebody during World War II and everybody had a stake in the military. And the thought that the military was infested with spies was scary beyond belief. The only problem was that it wasn't true. And Joe McCarthy set up a, a confrontation with the US Army and kept increasing the number of people that he said were spies there. And initially the army said, Joe, you just show us the spies and we will suspend them. And after a while, they realized the list was gonna keep growing and he didn't really know what he was talking about. So the army started fighting back. And this set up a confrontation, McCarthy on one side, the military on the other side, and the Senate decided the only way we're gonna get behind the truth here is we are gonna set up a set of hearings, the most watched the most highly publicized hearings in American history. And if you remember anything about those hearings, you will probably remember the fact that in the middle of the hearings, a short leprechaun-like lawyer from Boston named Joe Welch said what may have been the most famous words ever uttered by a lawyer in American history, then or now. And his words were, he, Joe McCarthy had gone after Welch's young law associate, accusing him of being a leftist and possibly a communist. And Welch uttered these words, Senator, have you no sense of decency? At long, loss, at long last, have you no decency? Those words were famous. America seemed to, at the same moment, be gasping and to be asking the same question. And I wanna just tell you quickly a couple things about those famous words. The only thing that Joe Welch was better at than being a lawyer was being an actor. And he had those words in his back pocket throughout the hearings, ready to deliver that line whenever McCarthy said something truly outrageous. And knowing Joe McCarthy the way Joe Welch did, he knew that would be sooner rather than later. And as dramatic as those words were, I think the real drama in the hearings was that by the time Joe Welch asked that question, whether McCarthy had any sense of decency, I think most of America had already concluded that he didn't have any sense of decency. And the real drama in those words was, were that by that moment, the guy who began the hearings looking like our great champion, Joe McCarthy standing up for the average soldier and the average American, by that moment, he looked like what he was, which was the town bully. Joe McCarthy began the hearings in, um, in early 1954 with fully 50% of America. George Gallup, the famous pollster, showed, told us that 50% of America thought that McCarthy was doing a great job. 50% meant that there was only one person in America more popular than, than Joe McCarthy, and that was our war hero president, Dwight Eisenhower. By the end of those hearings, by August 1954, his popularity had sunk 
from 50% to 34%. And magically, when it went down to 34%, something happened. And that something was that his fellow senators and President Eisenhower suddenly developed a backbone. They stood up against him, they raised questions about him, and by December 1954, for just the sixth time in American history, the Senate censured one of its own members. And Joe McCarthy, by that point, was toast. And I wanna show you, we're gonna go back to our share screen here, and I wanna just show you briefly what Joe McCarthy looked like at that moment. So I don't know if you recognize, obviously the guy in the middle holding up papers like Joe McCarthy always did is Joe McCarthy. The guy to his left as we're looking at that picture was a guy that you've probably never heard of, a guy from California, a very wealthy guy named G. David Shine. And he was the guy who was a private in the army that McCarthy was trying to get special treatment for. And he may or may not have been the lover of the guy to the right, who was a very famous, arrogant Jewish lawyer from New York named Roy Marcus Cohn. And we'll talk about Roy Cohn in a minute or two. But those were McCarthy's. He was flanked, as he always was, by his two most important aides, Shine and Cohn. And they were a big piece of what brought Joe McCarthy down in 1954. So he censured at the end of 54. The last moment that I wanna take you to is in the middle, in the spring of 1957. And I'm actually gonna go back to take you to that moment, back to our shared screen. And this is, This is Joe McCarthy's funeral. It's in Appleton, Wisconsin. The woman with the hat to the left, the white hat with the ribbon in front um, is Jean McCarthy, Joe's widow. He is getting full military honors when he is buried there at the at St. Mary's um, Church in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, all of the people that you see there are dignitaries one dignitary that you don't see because he's hiding out because he doesn't want anybody to see him is in a sea of Republicans, a guy named Bobby Kennedy, who had promised his brother Jack he wasn't gonna show up at the funeral, but he had worked for McCarthy alongside, alongside Roy Cohn, and he remained loyal to Joe McCarthy to the end of his life. He showed up at the funeral itself in the church and he hid out in the choir loft where he hoped nobody would see him. He was there at the graveside service, but he was hiding off where he hoped nobody would see him. After the funeral, Bobby Kennedy went up to all the reporters who were there and he begged them to keep his name out of the funeral stories so he wouldn't get in trouble with his big brother, Jack, who of course by 1957, or maybe from the day he was born, he was plotting his run for the White House and he didn't want to have his brother show up at the funeral of the notorious Joe McCarthy. But I brought you to that funeral, not because I think that McCarthy's burial was important, because, but because I'm trying to make a last point. And any of you who are Republicans uh, should not be offended, but if you want to, you can block your ears for a minute um, because I'm gonna make the point that while Joe McCarthy was buried at the end of 1957, McCarthyism wasn't buried with him. McCarthyism lived on in America. He was the archetype for every demagogue and bully who came afterwards. And the reason my book is called Demagogue rather than McCarthy is it is a book about more than just one man. It is a book trying to make the case that from the earliest days of our Republic, we have produced demagogues, they are names that you will recognize. They are people like Huey Long, the governor and senator and dictator from Louisiana, who if he hadn't been assassinated, wanted to challenge FDR for the presidency. They are people like the Jew-baiting radio preacher from Michigan and ultimate anti-Semite named Father Charles Coughlin. They are people who came after Joe McCarthy, like George Wallace and David Duke, and they are people who live on 
in America today. And I want to suggest whatever you think of him, that there is one person in America that we can't avoid talking about who has borrowed Joe McCarthy's playbook more than anybody else. And that is our 45th president. And I want to just read to you one set of quotes. And I promise this is the only thing I will read to you today. And the first is the most famous quote from Donald Trump in the 2016 campaign. And maybe you will remember this. He told his supporters that I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters. And you remember, remember that quote, it was a famous quote. Every columnist in America, whether they liked or hated Donald Trump, figured out a way to work that into their column. Exactly 62 years before Donald Trump uttered those words, a famous pollster named George Gallup said this about Joe McCarthy's supporters. And I quote, even if it were known that McCarthy had killed five innocent children, they would probably still go along with him. Now, I find the parallel between those quotes a bit chilling, but I find even more chilling the parallel between these two political figures. And I want to tell you just a few of those parallels in, in trying to support my suggestion that we're talking about Joe McCarthy not as a piece of ancient American history, but as something that we have to be aware of today and forever. Demagogues, in lieu of solutions, the demagogues point fingers. When demagogues are attacked, they aim a wrecking ball at their assailants. When one charge against a manufactured enemy is exposed as hollow, bullies and demagogues the next day lob a fresh bombshell. And as a former journalist, this is the one that maybe pains me the most. When a demagogue can't charm newsmen and newswomen, they blame them when the news is bad. And I want to suggest to you that there is a figure that we've already talked about very briefly that is a flesh and blood connection from Joe McCarthy to Donald Trump. And that was the very smart and very arrogant Jewish lawyer from New York named Roy Marcus Cohn that Donald Trump hired when he took over his very powerful permanent subcommittee on investigations. He needed a chief of staff. He wanted somebody smart and with a better track record than he, Joe McCarthy, had. And Roy Cohn had a track record of having prosecuted and convicted real communist spies. So McCarthy hires uh, Roy Cohn. And I wanna just, as an aside, say that McCarthy's second choice for that job was a, another smart young lawyer named Bobby Kennedy. And we can only imagine what might have happened to Joe McCarthy if instead of hearing whispering in his ear every day, Roy Cohn, he had been hearing Bobby Kennedy as the voice that was whispering in his ear. We don't know what would have happened, but I think we might have seen a different Joe McCarthy. He hires Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn reinforces every bad instinct that Joe McCarthy had. So this smart young lawyer, exactly 50 years later, is hired by two guys in New York named Fred Trump and Donald Trump to tutor a young Donald Trump as he is entering the world of New York real estate. Roy Cohn passes on to Donald Trump every lesson from the playbook that he has memorized from Joe McCarthy. Joe, Donald Trump, every time that he has gotten into trouble the last three and a half years, he said the same thing. He has said, I wish I had Roy Cohn by my side giving me advice. I think what he's really saying, but he can't say this because it's too controversial, is I wish I had Joe McCarthy by my side because the advice was not Roy Cohn's original advice. It was Joe McCarthy, through Roy Cohn to Donald Trump. I wanna just, before we break for questions, I wanna just tell you one last thing that I found interesting about Joe McCarthy that I had never read about before I wrote my book. And it's making a controversial point about him, but I think it's an important one and I think I can back it up. And it is 
that in addition to being a red baiter, which we all know about Joe McCarthy, in addition to being a gay basher, which you may or may not know about Joe McCarthy, you may know that there was something in, at the same time as we had this famous red scare, we also had what was known as the lavender scare. It was a campaign going after gays in our government and everywhere in American life. And it was a campaign that was not started by Joe McCarthy, but was fueled by Joe McCarthy. And if you recognize the name Roy Cohn and know anything about him, you will also recognize that Roy Cohn was gay. He died of AIDS. He had a number of gay lovers who have talked a lot about his being gay. And even though Roy Cohn never admitted to his dying day, to his dying day as he was dying of AIDS, that he was gay, he was not just gay, one more sign of how cynical he was is that he was helping fuel Joe McCarthy's gay bashing campaign, even as he himself was gay. But what I want to talk to you about is one last thing that Joe McCarthy, I think, was anti. Anti-red, anti-gay, and anti-Semitic. And I want to tell you my evidence on Joe McCarthy being an anti-Semite. It starts with the first campaign, the first crusade that he launched, which was not a crusade against communism. It was a campaign against the perpetrators of something known as the Malmedy Massacre. And my guess is you've probably never heard of the Malmedy Massacre, but if I tell you a few things about it, my guess is you'll also remember it. It was the most vicious campaign that the Nazis launched against American troops during World War II. An SS Panzer unit, one of Hitler's top units, in the, one of the earliest battles of the most famous last set of campaigns of World War II, the so-called Battle of the Bulge. In this battle, American soldiers at a little village called Malmedy in Belgium were quickly overwhelmed. They were surrounded and they did what soldiers should do in that circumstance. They raised the white flag of surrender. In classic Nazi fashion, the Germans saw their white flags and they proceeded to mow down or with the butts of their rifles to kill more than 150 American soldiers at Malmedy. After the war, we tracked down the perpetrators, we convicted them, and we sentenced them rightfully, sentenced them to death as one of the most famous of the Nuremberg trials. After that verdict, over in, in subsequent years, a number of peace activists, a number of ex-Nazis in Germany, a few journalists, and exactly one member of Congress questioned those verdicts. Joe McCarthy said the verdicts were what he called victor's justice. They were unfair that we had coerced confessions out of these Nazi perpetrators. He went a step further. He said that the real danger in the verdicts was that the disproportionate number of Jewish lawyers on the Nuremberg trial team were people who couldn't look objectively at anything the Nazis did, and they were the biggest coercers. Now, how tone deaf Joe McCarthy could have been is beyond my trying to diagnose, but that's my first piece of evidence. But if that was my only piece of evidence, we could just say he was a jerk and he was an idiot, but not that he was anti-Semitic. But his friends tell us over the years that he used slurs to refer to Jews, slurs like heeb, and slurs like one that you may or may not recognize, but it was one of the worst slurs of that era. It was a word, sheeny. And I don't know if anybody recognizes the word sheeny, but that was something that Jews were called as a slur word. But it doesn't stop there. My evidence goes on to say that when he went after the army, before those army McCarthy hearings, there were, for some reason, a disproportionate number, and I mean a grossly disproportionate number of the people he was pointing a finger at at Fort Monmouth who happened to be Jewish. And you don't trust me on that. You trust the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, which came in and ran an investigation and concluded 
that there was a rat somewhere and it wasn't a red rat like the ones that McCarthy was pointing at. It was a rat that there were just too many Jews that were somehow showing up on his list of alleged communists. And I think from beginning to end, Joe McCarthy was going after, even more than he was going after gays and reds, he was going after the Eastern elite establishment, Harvard University, Wall Street, and the Jews that he felt were a big piece of the establishment in America in that post-World War 1950 era. And I think that, that it, was, it was something that I am willing to point a finger at him and say that he was an anti-Semite, that the ADL was willing to point a finger, that the forward, the Jewish forward newspaper was willing to publish these charges. And there was a very long piece that I wrote on this theme in Smithsonian Magazine, looking at this part of Joe McCarthy's record that has gotten buried in history. And I think it's one that I bring up, not just because this is a disproportionately Jewish audience, but because I think it's a piece of the McCarthy story that we can now fully tell that gives a sense of just how sinister Joe McCarthy's finger pointing was. And what I think I would like to do at this point um, is turn it over to Ari and see whether there are people's questions. Um, I wanna just say actually before I do that, one last thing. And again, anybody who is an avid Trump supporter can, if you think that this will offend you, you can block your ears for a minute. But I wanna say that my book is a book about one of the bleakest figures in American history, low blow Joe McCarthy, as he was known. But in fact, it's a good news story. And I wanna tell you why this book is a good news story. And it's not just because I think a bleak book won't sell and a good news one might. It is because the good news of our long history of bullies and demagogues in the American society, this uniquely American strain of, of demagogue, there is one thing that characterizes them all. And that is given enough rope, every one of them has hung themselves. Whether we're talking Huey Long or George Wallace or the archetype of all demagogues, Joe McCarthy. And I think that given enough time, Americans, even when we buy into bullies, and their simplistic answers, we eventually and generally in time rediscover our better nature and kick the bully out the way we did Joe McCarthy almost as fast as we invite them into our political lives. So I think Joe McCarthy should give anybody who is discouraged in America about where we're heading a bit of hope and there are brighter horizons again. And Ari, any questions? Uh, first of all, thank you, and um, looking forward to reading your book. You had obliquely mentioned that you gained information about uh, what Joe McCarthy really died of and some of the, the, the struggles he had. Can you share that with us so we um, get a better understanding of him and his actions? Great. Um, I will share that. I want to tell you first what the coroner at the time told us in his report and what every reporter in the world repeated, which was that Joe McCarthy died of acute hepatitis. And my guess is there are a lot of doctors in this um, Zoom group, but I wanna tell you, uh, when I saw all of his medical records, I didn't, I was a medical journalist for much of my life, but I sure as heck didn't trust myself to look over those records and see whether that was the true story. I invited in a guy who had just stepped down as Dean of the Harvard Medical School, another person who was the editor in chief emeritus of the New England Journal of Medicine and two other smart doctors. We read all the thousands of pages of his medical records. And I can say conclusively that Joe McCarthy died of being a, an over the top alcoholic. He drank himself to death. In his last two days, something very unusual happened, something that probably has never happened before in American or world history and will never happen again. And that is that a medical orderly was stationed at his bedside and wrote down every word that McCarthy said, every one of his rantings and ravings when he was in the DTs, every word that his doctors and nurses said, every test that was delivered to him 
to his bedside. Uh, and I think they did that. Why the heck would they do that? And I think they did that because McCarthy was the master of the grand conspiracy. And I think that the military understandably worried that someday there would be a conspiracy about what had killed or who had killed Joe McCarthy. And it turns out that there were conspiracy theories. The FBI investigated reports of everything from his being poisoned by arsenic. His wife, his widow said that the one day she had left his bedside, some strange looking people were wandering around and she wondered whether they somehow poisoned him. We have his records. We have a witness at his bedside who never left there. Joe McCarthy died because he drank far too much. And that not only explains his death, it explains his life as a public figure. When he was conducting hearings, his, the witnesses in the morning were treated politely, generally. The witnesses in the afternoon after he had his classic lunch of a hamburger, a raw onion, and lots of whiskey, his fuse was shorter, his temper went off the rails, and if you were a witness in the afternoon and you stood up to him, you were gonna be destroyed. And I think alcohol explains a whole lot about his behavior throughout his public career. And I think we also have to destigmatize alcoholism by talking about it and by listing it as a cause of death when we know that's what killed somebody. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the press back then? I, unlike some of the people in the audience, I was not around um, at that time. Uh, did the press um, help to uh, uh, get to the truth about McCarthy? Were they prevented from doing the truth? Did they, did they not do what they should have done? Um, and maybe compare it to what's going on today. In, so if I, knew how to give, if I knew how to give a brief answer, my answer would be yes, yes, and yes. The press enabled McCarthy from the very beginning. He understood how to exploit the press by turning around on them the very rules that the press used in governing their behavior. He didn't choose Wheeling, West Virginia to deliver that powerful speech as an accident. He knew that when he was going to somewhere in the middle of nowhere, like Wheeling, West Virginia, there would be what there were, which is exactly two reporters there. One from a local newspaper called the Wheeling Intelligencer and the other a, an outlying reporter from the Associated Press. He knew that they would have no idea who to call in Washington to get a response to his charges in that same day's story. And he knew if he delivered his speech at night, just before the reporter's deadline, even if they knew who to call, they, couldn't, they wouldn't have time to make those phone calls. He exploited the press and the press let him exploit them. Reporters today and every day like one thing more than anything. They wanna be in page one of their newspaper. If you're a New York Times reporter, you dream of getting that cherished space on the front of the newspaper. And Joe McCarthy put the reporters there more than any politician of his era. And they loved being there and they therefore would print his charges on page one and print the responses the next day on page 24. But if the press enabled McCarthy at the beginning, the press also brought him down in the end. And it was not the reporter that Hollywood tells us brought him down, who was a famous reporter named Edward R. Murrow. And there was a wonderful movie called Good Night and Good Luck, which told us that Edward R. Murrow was the great McCarthy Slayer. The real McCarthy Slayer was a reporter that you may remember who was the most popular columnist and radio broadcaster in America of that era, a guy named Drew Pearson. Drew Pearson wrote 70, I'm sorry, 60 scathing columns about Joe McCarthy, and he paid two prices for that. One night when Drew Pearson and Joe McCarthy encountered one another in the cloakroom of a very posh Washington supper club, McCarthy started uh, physically whacking Drew Pearson. And if it hadn't been for a famous Quaker peacemaker named Richard Nixon, who stepped between the two of them, McCarthy would have pummeled Pearson that night. But what pummeling he restrained himself from giving Pearson that night, he did a different kind of pummeling a week or two later when he took on Drew Pearson's largest sponsor, 
of his radio broadcast, a company that you may remember called the Adam Hat Company, one of the most popular hat companies in an era when American men and women both wore hats. He told his supporters not to buy Adam Hats if they kept sponsoring Drew Pearson. Adam Hats withdrew their sponsorship and Drew Pearson never found another sponsor like that. So Joe McCarthy knew how to charm the press and he knew how to intimidate the press and his intimidation of Drew Pearson sent a chilling message across the entire press establishment. Going back to um, Joe McCarthy and anti-Semitism, if he was anti-Semitic or anti-Semitic, why did he have um, such a close uh, counsel who was himself Jewish in Roy Cohn? So that's a great question, and I don't want you to trust my answer. I want you to trust the answer that Joe McCarthy gave his friends at the time when they wanted to know. Many of his friends, friends were among the leading anti-Semitic and right-wing groups uh, in America. And they said, what did you hire? Not just one Jew, but two Jews, Roy Cohn and his sidekick, David Shine. And McCarthy said, I hired them because I'm being accused of being an anti-Semite uh, anti and it's the perfect fig leaf. You hire a Jew and nobody can accuse you, especially if the Jew is by your side all the time. Whether McCarthy did that, I think McCarthy was smart. And I think he hired Roy Cohn for two reasons. One is because he was brilliant. And the other was for that reason, because he was being attacked by the ADL and others. And if he had a Jew by his side, that deflected the attacks. Roy Cohn, every time somebody accused McCarthy in a public or private hearing of being an anti-Semite, McCarthy didn't defend himself. Roy Cohn defended McCarthy. And he would say, I'm Jewish. I'm a leading member of B'nai B'rith. Joe McCarthy wouldn't have hired me if he was an anti-Semite. So you've been uh, doing lots of talks about this book. I, I was driving around after we spoke and, and got our date, and I heard you on NPR. Uh, which interview has been uh, the best interview so far? Well, obviously, this program has been the best program overall. I, I know that. But uh, who, who have you enjoyed most as an interviewer uh, in your uh, recent um, a dog and pony show, I guess, for your book? Yes. So I want to answer that in two ways. One is to say I've enjoyed the interviewers who have actually read the book. And I can tell which ones have read the book or not by which ones use the set of questions that my book publicist gives them and reads just my old questions or the ones who ask questions that clearly show that they took the time to read the book. And it's tough for any radio person or any journalist generally to find that time, but the good ones find it. And the second thing I want to say is that my favorite interviewer of all time is somebody named Terry Gross, who has a show called Fresh Air. And she is one of the few interviewers in America who asks questions that no matter how well prepared you are and how could you be better prepared than having written a 500 page book on somebody, she will always figure out a way to put you a little bit at uh, out of ease and she's just extraordinary. And she's the interviewer who also matters the most in a post Oprah Winfrey world. Oprah, Win Oprah Winfrey used to be able to make your book into an overnight bestseller just by saying its name. And in that post Oprah world, Terry Gross is the closest thing to that. And she's great. In our last few minutes, could you just tell us a little bit about your other books and how you choose your subjects? So yeah, I want to say that anybody who listens to Fresh Air, I was surprised to turn on Fresh Air and hear myself on it, not for Joe McCarthy, but I was on it. Um, they were rebroadcasting today a 10-year-old interview I did on a guy named Satchel Paige, a great baseball player and a racial pioneer. And this happens to be, we're celebrating now the 100th anniversary of the Negro Leagues. And Satchel Paige was the most entertaining, not just entertaining Negro Leaguer, and not just most entertaining black ball player, and not just most entertaining baseball player, but to me, he was one of the most entertaining figures in American life. And an author likes every one of their books like a parent likes every one of their childs equally. But if there was any book that I loved more than the others, it was Satchel Paige because it was two 
books in one. It was half a biography of Satchel Paige and half a biography of another iconic American character named Jim Crow. And I was convinced that no kid in America who doesn't know the story of race in America would ever sit down and read a biography of Jim Crow unless I disguised it as a biography of this extraordinary baseball player. One other quick thing I wanna say about a book that I loved writing and it was a book about Superman. And again, that was two books in one. It was partly a biography of America's longest lasting hero, the iconic Superman, but it was more a book since for any of you, I hate to disabuse you, but he was not a real character. And for, um, it was also a biography of two other people. It was a, a look, my trying to look at what our embrace of Superman told us about who we hold dear in America, what values and what real heroes we hold dear. And the other it was a book about me or every scrawny little Jewish kid who grows up thinking that if the girl we have a crush on was smart enough to look within us, they would see that we're not that uh, schlubby looking Clark Kent character, that deep within us there is a superhero. And as you may or may not know, Superman was created by two extraordinary Jewish kids from Cleveland, Ohio named Schuster and Siegel. And they put in the book, I'm, I'm sorry, they put in their first comic book and in all the things they wrote after that, a bunch of hint, hints that Superman was in fact Jewish. Everything from his coming down to earth and being rescued, uh, his, his drop to earth from the planet Krypton was the Moses story uh, all over it. His name, his Kryptonian name, Kal El, um, Paul or anybody who speaks Hebrew can tell us that Kal, Kal El, and I'm probably mispronouncing it, is Hebrew for sort of an all embracing God. And he, everything they did in this book was some little hint that they were writing a story about themselves and their world. And they grew up in a very Jewish part of Cleveland, Ohio, and everything in their world was Jewish and everything about their character was Jewish. And the idea that we in this largely Christian nation that they embraced as their hero, this Jewish character named Superman, or as Terry Gross called him, Superman. She said, we have uh, Klepperman, we have Siegelman, and we have Superman. And the, he was just irresistible to me. So at the end of my book talk on Superman, at the end of every book talk I gave, and especially to Jewish audiences, I would hold out my shirt and be wearing underneath it this wonderful shirt that was Superman with instead of his normal symbol, he was a star of David surrounding Superman and suggesting what I was trying to say to them that he was an all-American Jewish character. And I wanna say, speaking of all-American, I've got exactly 30 seconds left here. And I wanna say that Ari is all-American in having me in this weird guy in the middle of Cape Cod to talk about a nasty character like Joe McCarthy. And I wanna say that you have been a terrific audience. And I wanna say, I will not be self-promoting enough to say that I want you to go out and buy my book. But I wanna say, if you go out and buy my book, I would love you to do it, not on Amazon, but at an independent bookstore. And if you email me and want a signed book plate, the thing I most miss other than seeing an audience live is getting to actually sign books live because it's a blast. You write mini essays and you personalize them and you do whatever. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your weekend and Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Shabbat Shalom, thank you. Shout out to my parents, Aubrey and Rolene Katz, who are joining us, not from Cape Cod, but from uh, where they usually would be, but from uh, Newton or Chestnut Hill. And to my aunt, Adrian from Newton and to all of you, have a great rest of your day. Remember, four o'clock today is a live from Zoomer Canyon Part Two. Duvid Swirsky, Jewish folk rock meets Nefesh Mountain, Jewish bluegrass. Uh, join us and see uh, how it turns out. I think you'll enjoy it. Have a great Shabbos, everybody, and a great rest of your day and a, and a healthy and safe weekend. Thanks. Hi, everybody.
Thanks for joining us.